Do you feel like despite your best efforts, your symptoms are running your life? Have you ever wondered if without being aware, you are making your fibromyalgia symptoms worse? Maybe it's something you're doing or maybe even what you're not doing. You're not alone in this struggle. Today, I am going to share 10 ways in which you may be unknowingly making your symptoms worse. Hi guys, I'm Daniela and you're watching Through the Looking Glass where we foster resilience and inspire lives. Today, we're diving into 10 mistakes people with fibromyalgia make. Let's see if we can navigate these waters together and find ways to make our journey a little bit easier. Number one, it's ignoring your body's signals. Ignoring our body's signals is a trap many of us fall into, often without realizing it. This habit of brushing aside our discomfort of wearing our endurance like a badge of honor is more harmful than we might think. Each time we choose to ignore these signals, we're not only just overlooking a momentary pain or a bout of tiredness, we're potentially contributing to stress, inflammation, and exacerbating the very core our fibromyalgia symptoms. It's a cycle that can lead to increased sensitivity to pain, more profound fatigue and other symptoms. But what does listening to our body truly means? It's more than just hitting pause and taking a break. It's about developing a sense of awareness and understanding what our body is communicating. Is that worsening pain in your back a sign to slow down? Does that relentless fatigue mean you need to reconsider your plans for the day? Today, you might be able to handle a short walk, but tomorrow, maybe just some light stretching is all that is feasible. And that's okay. It is not a step back. It's an act of self-compassion, of tuning to what your body needs at that moment. So let's start changing our approach. Let's view these signs not as obstacles, but as guides leading us towards a more balanced relationship with our bodies. It's called respecting our bodies, which is nothing less than respecting ourselves. Number two is sticking to old routines. Change is hard but sticking to routines that no longer serve us can hinder our progress. It's a natural human tendency to find comfort in the familiar, in the well-traveled paths of our daily lives, but when living with fibromyalgia, these routines may need to change to adapt your changing symptoms. Fibromyalgia brings an ever-changing landscape of abilities and limitations. What worked for us before may not work now, and clinging to those old routines can place additional strain on our bodies and minds. It's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It simply doesn't align with the current reality. So what does modify your activities look like? It's about being honest with ourselves about our current abilities and limitations. It's recognizing that some days our energy levels and pain thresholds may be different, and that's okay. For example, if you loved doing yoga every morning but now find it too difficult, consider switching to a gentler form of exercise like Tai Chi or maybe even trying a different time of the day. Another example is if cooking meals from scratch has become overwhelming, it's okay to simplify and use some store-bought alternatives to ease your load. Or consider batch cooking on your better days so that you have those foods available on your worst days. It's also about being creative and flexible with how you approach your daily tasks. Maybe it's breaking down tasks into smaller, more manageable steps or finding new tools and technologies to assist us. Number three is neglecting diet and nutrition. The role of diet and nutrition in managing fibromyalgia is a topic that often gets overlooked. But the truth is, what we put into our bodies can have a profound impact on how we feel, both physically and mentally. Diet has a bad connotation and we often associate it with boring food and restrictions. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's so many resources online for amazing recipes and inspiration. I'll link a few of my favorite YouTubers in the description below if you're looking for some inspiration. The connection between diet and fibromyalgia is not about following the latest trend or adhering to a restrictive eating plan. It's about understanding how certain foods can affect our symptoms and overall well-being. For instance, some people with fibromyalgia may find that certain foods trigger flare-ups and increase sensitivity to pain. 
others might find out that their energy levels are significantly influenced by what they eat. So what does a balanced diet look like for someone with fibromyalgia? First, it's about variety and moderation. It's including a range of foods that provide essential nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that our bodies need to function optimally. This means incorporating plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, and healthy fats into our meals. I'm not a dietitian or nutritionist, but I did get some nutrition training during my formation as a midwife and I find following something like the Mediterranean diet the best. It's very flexible and super tasty. It's also about being mindful of foods that might make symptoms worse. Some common foods that make inflammation worse are processed foods, sugary snacks, caffeine, and alcohol. This doesn't mean you have to cut these out entirely, but being aware of how they impact your body and minimizing the consumption is key. Keeping a food diary can be helpful too in identifying any patterns patterns between your diet and your fibromyalgia symptoms. Hydration is also another crucial aspect of nutrition that's often forgotten. Drinking enough water throughout the day can help with fatigue and cognitive function. Remember, the goal of paying attention to nutrition is not about perfection. It's about making conscious choices that support your health and your well-being. Before you put anything in your mouth, ask yourself, is this food going to support my health? Do I really want to eat this? If yes, for what reason? Is it because I'm hungry and I want to fuel my body? Or is it because I'm feeling down and in pain and I want an instant dopamine boost? It's worth experimenting with this and finding out what works best for your body. Consulting with a nutritionist or dietitian, especially one that is familiar with fibromyalgia, can help if you're feeling overwhelmed and need some personalized advice. Number four overlooking exercise. Now, let's talk about the taboo subject, exercise. The mere thought of exercising can be intimidating, especially when you can't even find the energy to have a shower. But incorporating gentle physical activities into your routine can be a game changer in managing pain, improving fatigue, and even mood. When we exercise, our body releases endorphins, those natural mood lifters and pain relievers. Also, exercise can help improve sleep quality. Now, what do I mean by gentle activities? This include exercises that are low impact and don't put excessive strain on the body. Yoga, for instance, is a great option because every pose can be adapted to where you are in your physical journey. If you're having a bad day, you can make any pose easier. It also incorporates breath work and meditation, which can be great for anxiety and depression. Yoga not only helps in increasing flexibility and strength, but also promotes relaxation and stress reduction, which are vital for managing fibromyalgia. Walking is another great choice. It's simple, accessible, maybe not if you're in Canada during the winter, but it can be easily tailored to your individual needs and fitness level. The key is to start slow and listen to your body. Begin with short sessions, maybe just a few minutes a day, and gradually build up your duration and intensity. This gradual approach helps in avoiding overexertion and potential flare-ups. It's also important to find an activity that you enjoy, as this really increases the likelihood that you will stick with it. I have been struggling a lot in this area lately. My body is not tolerating anything more than some gentle stretches. It is so frustrating because anytime I do even gentle Mental exercises, it triggers a two-week flare. It hasn't always been that way, but it's what's going on at the moment. And that brings me back to my first point, which is to not ignore my body's signals. It's hard, but I had to accept that stretches is all I am able to do at the moment. Now and then, when I feel I'm doing a little bit better, I'll push my body a little and see how it responds. But I'm not going to lie, I often get it wrong and end up triggering a flare. But that's what it's like to live with fibromyalgia. Constant experimenting with trying to live a normal life. Number five is not prioritizing sleep. Sleep isn't just a period of rest. It's a vital time when our bodies undergo repair and our brains process the information it has received during the day. Poor sleep can disrupt this essential process, leading to heightened pain sensitivity, increased fatigue, and host a lot of other challenging symptoms. In fact, research has shown a strong link between 
in sleep quality and fibromyalgia symptom severity. If I don't get enough sleep, my body produces so much inflammation that I have actually ended up in hospital in the past. It was pretty brutal when I used to work as a midwife on call 24 seven. And one of the reasons I am no longer working as a midwife, my body simply cannot handle lack of sleep. I find the sleep in the context of fibromyalgia a little bit like what came first, the egg or the chicken. Lack of sleep increases pain, but pain can make sleeping hard. And so you find yourself in this perpetual cycle. Besides the difficulty in falling asleep, achieving restful sleep also can be a challenge with fibromyalgia. Some people will take medication for that. Some antidepressants have an effect in your sleep cycles and can help you get more of the deep sleep cycle in your sleep. And some people even take sleeping pills. I am one of those and it is the only thing that helps me go into a deep sleep. I have this ring called Aura that tracks my sleep and it shows all the sleep cycles. And it's so interesting to see that I only get deep sleep in the first four hours after taking the medication. And that's exactly the drug's half-life. If you don't know what that means, it means the time it takes for the amount of a drug to be reduced by half. So after that point in time, there will be less than half of the active substance in your body. And I can definitely see that after the initial four hours, my ability to enter deep sleep gets lower and lower as the night goes on. And when I don't take it, I don't get any deep sleep at all. This has also been proved during a sleep study I did where I slept in a lab and I was hooked to all sorts of wires and they can see exactly what's going on with your sleep. So for me, sleeping pills are non-negotiable, but I have to tell you that they are extremely addictive. And once on them, you be dependent on them for sleep. Now, for me, it doesn't really matter because I was already not sleeping without them. So I just take them and make sure I get enough sleep. If you would like some tips on how to get better sleep with fibromyalgia, I have a video about that and I'll leave a link in the description below. Next is isolating yourself. Isolating yourself can be a natural response when you're experiencing chronic pain and fatigue. I mean, when I'm not feeling good, I'm not very pleasant to be around. I'm not smiling, I lose my sense of humor, I complain. So in order to not be that person, I distance myself from people. That way, I'm not that negative person or I don't have to pretend that everything is okay because that takes a lot of energy. Energy I don't have when I'm already dealing with so much pain and fatigue. But, and that is a very important but, there is a huge link between isolation, depression, and pain perception. When we isolate ourselves, we miss out on emotional support and validation that come from interacting with others. Human connection plays a huge role in our mental and emotional well-being. Without it, we can find ourselves slipping into feelings of loneliness and depression, which increases our pain. It's a cycle that can be hard to break free once it starts. So how can we combat isolation? The first step is recognizing the importance of staying connected, not just for our emotional health, but also for our physical well-being. Let me know if you're interested in a video about staying connected with chronic illness. By staying connected with others, we open ourselves to support, empathy, and a sense of belonging, all of which are crucial for our mental and emotional health. Let's break the chains of isolation and discover the strength that comes from being part of a community. Number seven is skipping medications and appointments. First, let's address the issue of staying on top of medication refills. For anyone, but especially for those of us dealing with the brain fog that comes with fibromyalgia, keeping track of medication can be difficult. It requires a level of organization that can feel overwhelming when you're also managing daily symptoms. Some medications, like the one I take, low-dose naltrexone, needs to be compounded and that takes time. So being on top of refills is even more important because I can't just go to the pharmacy and have it refilled the same day. Then there's the emotional side of taking medication, the side effects, the cost, and unfortunately the judgment from others that can make the experience of being on medications challenging. I find myself every now and then deciding to experiment with not taking my medications, wondering if I still need to be on them. This might 
friends is a whole I have gone down more than once and I always end up putting myself into another flare. You would think that by now I would have learned my lesson, but the temptation to see if I can manage without medication is still arises from time to time. I do not recommend it. I always regret it every single time. Also, it's tempting to skip on our checkups, especially if your interaction with your doctor is not always pleasant, but they're essential for monitoring the effectiveness of our medications, discussing a new or changing symptoms, and managing potential side effects. Number eight is ignoring mental health. When dealing with fibromyalgia, it's pretty common to also face mental health challenges like anxiety and depression. Ignoring these not only affect our enjoyment of life, but they can actually make symptoms worse. Think of it like this. When you're dealing with constant pain and the daily grind of managing fibromyalgia, it's totally normal to feel stressed or down. And when our mental health isn't at its best, it can make the pain feel even worse. They are constantly affecting each other. So getting help for mental health isn't just about feeling less anxious, it's a big part of fibromyalgia management. Talking to someone like a therapist about anxiety or feeling low can actually help with the physical symptoms too. It's about tackling fibromyalgia from all sides, body and mind. Number nine is setting unrealistic expectations. When you're dealing with fibromyalgia, it's super easy to fall into the habit of setting goals that are just too high. We've all been there, right? You get a good day and suddenly you think you can conquer the world. I have done this multiple times regarding work. I get a month where I'm feeling a little bit better, I have my symptoms more under control, and then I feel I can do anything. Then I decide I'm going to get a job, and then as soon as I commit to something, I get into a flare. Maybe it's the stress of knowing that I have a commitment and the fear of what if I have a migraine when I have to go to work? What if my pain is out of control? I think the stress on itself is enough to put me into a flare. So maybe it is unrealistic for me to work at the moment, at least anything that doesn't give me the flexibility to do the work when I'm having a good day. At the moment, I have more bad days than good days, so going to work might not be the right expectations for me right now. It's all about finding that sweet spot, setting goals that are just right for where you are right now. And last, number 10, not advocating for yourself. Not advocating for yourself can be a significant barrier to receiving the care and support you need. It's crucial to be your own advocate in managing fibromyalgia. Being your own advocate means more than just speaking up. It's about knowing your condition well enough to engage in productive conversations with your doctors. It's about doing your research, preparing questions before appointments, and not hesitating to ask for a second opinion if something doesn't feel right. But it doesn't have to stop at a doctor's office. Self-advocacy extends to your workplace, where it might mean discussing adjustments to your working environment or schedule to accommodate your needs. It's about finding the courage to express what you need to perform at your best, even on your worst days. In your personal life, advocating for yourself means setting boundaries and communicating your limits. It's about educating those close to you on what fibromyalgia entails and what support looks like for you. It's a balance between asking for help and maintaining your independence and it requires clarity and honesty about your capabilities and needs. It's acknowledging to yourself and others that your needs are valid, your pain is real, and you deserve to be heard and accommodated. This journey with fibromyalgia is deeply personal and becoming your own advocate is a step towards reclaiming control of your life. The path to effective self-advocacy is continuous and evolving. It's about building confidence in your understanding of fibromyalgia and asserting that knowledge to improve your quality of life. Advocating for yourself is not selfish, it's necessary. As we wrap up, let's reflect on how empowering it can be to advocate for yourself. Imagine the difference it could make in managing your symptoms, in your interaction with healthcare professionals, and in your relationships. 
It's about making your journey with fibromyalgia a collaborative one where you're an active participant in your care. Thank you for spending this time with me, diving into the mistakes we can avoid and the steps that we can take towards better management of fibromyalgia. Your engagement and willingness to learn and grow inspire me every day. And with that, my friends, I hope this video has given you some insight and encouragement. Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. I love hearing from all of you. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more content like this. I look forward to our next video together. Until then, take care of yourself and keep advocating for the life you deserve. I'll see you in the next one.